Greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's video in which we will begin the construction of the most unusual amplifier you will ever see in your life. I was so pleased with the reception that the Art Deco amp and uh, speaker cabinet received that I thought well why don't we continue uh, and make another unusually designed amp. While considering what style to use for this construction it occurred to me that there's really just two basic styles of all amplifiers. There's a vertical style of the very early amps with the round speaker uh, opening here with maybe a grill of some sort or a speaker cloth uh, controls generally at the rear horizontal at the bottom or top if they're at the top then the speaker hole moves down and we have a flexible usually leather or maybe even a luggage style handle. More modern amp styles simply turn this on its side uh, go with a rectangular uh, speaker grill and still horizontal controls and now uh, probably a just a rubber flat uh, sort of a belt like handle that will fold down into the uh, clips on either end. Then I thought why not make a amp head uh, like the Art Deco uh, cabinet in which uh, it wasn't just a plain rectangle like all heads are. I rounded this corner here and this vertical edge here but overall it was still a, a horizontal rectangle with horizontal controls. Now you've got to admit about 99.9% .9 of all the amplifiers on earth follow these three body styles and to me I think we've gotten into a really boring repetitious rut so I thought why not try something really different thought why not try something like this a cathedral radio pretty good size say with a 10 inch speaker some snazzy like electronic uh, lightning bolt uh, grill here and then uh, the horizontal uh, controls at the bottom with the chassis and all right down here on the floor just like it is in a cathedral radio then I thought, well, then I'm just copying something else that's rather trite and repetitious. So I decided, why not try something completely uh, unusual to kind of turn the whole amp design uh, business on its head. And let's turn the cathedral radio upside down. Okay, get a good hold on your beer and your lounge chair because here it comes. Okay. Now, now that you're through snickering or gagging, let me explain to you uh, the design that I came up with. Next to Art Deco, I think the steampunk style is really neat. Okay, it's popular now. It's also the style that I used really for my two uh, electromechanical tremolos that I have made. If you haven't seen them yet, you need to go back and check previous videos. Um, and uh, so I thought I'm going to try to make a steampunk amp. It will consist of various metals. I'll use copper, aluminum, but mostly coal rolled steel. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to paint it or if I'm going to use chemicals to alter the color or texture of the metals. Uh, that'll come later. But for now we just need to make this beast. Let me go over the design details that I came up with. First off, it looks vaguely like a face with a neck okay sort of robotic which goes along with the steampunk style the controls will be vertical not horizontal which is something you never see except maybe in some early Gretsch amps that had the uh, amplifier vertical along one side of the cabinet okay now uh, the controls will be bass treble it's going to have a tremolo so we're going to have speed and intensity for our tremolo. There'll be two inputs, uh, a high and low gain input, and I'll probably make like a gear backing uh, escutcheon plate for each of those just to reinforce the style. There will be probably fake rivets all the way around the perimeter and the base to give it a real kind of a machine look. 
the handle will uh, not be flexible leather it's going to be aluminum strap which is going to have a holes cut in it which is sort of an automotive thing and then a copper handle um, the top is going to be a very coarse mesh that looks real industrial rather than a fine mesh like a fly swatter okay this will add to the machine appearance of it next there will be animated pilot light holes now I'm not going to tell you what's going to be in here but these will be large oval cutouts that will serve as a pilot light and also the word animated uh, will tell you something there will be motion involved that you will see through these windows I think it's going to really be neat it's like a factory like you're peeking in the window of a steam powered factory over here uh, we're going to have the volume dial which will be a very elaborate uh, exaggerated dial over here on the right side and then on the left is going to be a gauge to show what the volume is now those of you who have seen uh, the posting that I put on my Facebook page Uncle Doug vintage amps I remember that Bell Laboratories amplifier I'm going to show it to you in just a second that had this sort of really silly over engineered uh, characteristic and that is there were knobs below and then uh, backlit I guess gauges up above and it seemed kind of silly because you could look at the knob and tell what the volume is but no instead the gauge is going to tell you what the volume is. So I thought, well, that's just too neat not to use. And also we're going to exaggerate it. We're going to make it gigantic. Okay, a great big, probably metal volume dial, and then some outrageous uh, steam-looking uh, gauge over here to show what the volume is. Here is the Bell Sound Systems amp from eBay. And the over-engineering here is what really inspired me on that little steampunk amp. And that is they have the knobs down below and they have meters up above. So rather than force you to look all the way down here to see the position of the knob, you can just look up here to see its position. Uh, now granted this may be backlit and maybe this is uh, for use in the dark, although I can't imagine it. Um, it's still that over engineering really caught my eye the neck part here will have a plate on the front with matching rivets but the rear as you can see over here is going to be open so that the cord can be coiled up and stashed in there the uh, amp chassis will occupy the upper half probably from about here up uh, and uh, there should be plenty of room because it's rather co uh, constricted in in uh, available space I'm going to use the most basic um, tremolo amp uh, circuit I could think of which would be a vibro champ okay now that's going to give uh, the usual champ tone which is wonderful plus a really nice uh, tremolo as you can see it's going to fit in here that's the back of the uh, one of the tone pots uh, also there will be like a little control panel that comes down from the chassis and then there will be a matching back door with the coarse grill work up here to ventilate the uh, uh, chassis and a uh, matching kind of an oval hole down here that matches these holes uh, that gives you access to all of your rear controls the toggle on off switch the uh, 4 ohm and 8 ohm output fuse uh, holder and grommeted power cord. I will have to invent some sort of linkage that runs between the volume dial and the volume gauge that doesn't interfere with the wiring or anything else that's going on in here. Uh, that should be an engineering challenge uh, which actually I look forward to. That's why I build these things and that's why I didn't want to go out in the workshop and make another finger jointed rectangular box uh, that makes noise. Uh, what I decided would be a lot more inspirational would be to make a metal sculpture that could hold its own unplugged and sitting on the shelf. People would say, my God, that's a weird looking sculpture. And you could say, yeah, well, watch this. Plug it in, plug in your guitar, plug in a speaker cabinet, and blow their doors off. Okay, so it's a dual purpose, knock your socks off type of device and it leaves all sorts of room for creativity I have no idea how this thing's going to really end up I have no idea what finish I'll put on it how I'm going to connect this to this um, 
if I can bend the metal properly or any of that. But uh, if this sounds interesting to you, or if you're curious to see me either have a spectacular success or failure, then stay tuned because we're headed for the workshop and it's time to get to work. Or if this sounds like the absurd product of a diseased mind, then by all means just stay in the easy chair and watch some uh, Russian pole dance videos. Heck, I might do that too. But um, stick with me. Give me a chance here. Let's see if we can't make this work. Hey, Ollie, how about a nice breakfast roll? Oh, there you go. Looks like you made your own. What a good girl. Jack, of course, is jealous of all the attention and treats that Ollie gets. Right, Jack? Huh? Yeah, see? He agrees. He admits it. He's trying to open the door so he can go out and join her for breakfast. For this project, I am finally going to get to use coal rolled steel. Uh, the metal yard insisted that I had to buy a 4x10 sheet, uh, but I talked them into cutting off a 2 foot uh, by 4 foot section. Um, you notice how it is uh, silvery, shiny, and bare metal, unlike that uh, hot rolled that I have been using, which has that black scale on the surface. This will be much easier to work with and finish, and also uh, much easier to weld. I intend to use the plasma cutter as I did on the last project. I have my straight edge here uh, firmly clamped to guide the cutting head along that straight line. Once that elongated rectangle has been successfully cut out of the sheet of coal roll steel, then uh, we'll use uh, various uh, cylindrical objects, pipes, and other things to bend a uniform curvature in the rectangle and then mark it on the tabletop, flip it over and double check to make sure both sides are exactly symmetric. Once the rectangular piece is properly bent and shaped, then we can set it down on our steel sheet, mark around it with a magic marker, and then cut out a front and back which will fit the curved piece perfectly. In this case I'm using a, a saber saw uh, rather than the plasma cutter. Then once this front plate is cut out, uh, I lay out the design uh, for the controls and other details that will be on the face plate and then start machining with step bits, uh, saber saws, uh, drill bits and things like that. Whatever it takes to get this thing uh, to have all the proper holes and designs and patterns that you need. Once the front plate machining is finished, then it's time to tack weld the curved side to the front plate. The front panel is now securely tack welded to the curved side. And now it's time to very carefully grind off that little lip of metal from the face plate that is overlapping the curved side. Then to make it look real steampunkish, I use the welder to make uh, studs or rivets all the way around the perimeter of the front. Next, I got a piece of 16 gauge coarsely perforated steel. Then cut a piece that exactly fit the top of the cabinet, welded it in place, and then ground the edges so that the seams were invisible. Now we have a really industrial looking metal cabinet and uh, next step will be to come up with some sort of feet or base that will hold it uh, very steadily. I came up with a concept for a platform that will attach to the bottom of the amp cabinet uh, and be very sturdy and hold the amp vertical. I cut a piece of 18 by 5 and a half inch uh, 16 gauge steel and now I'm going to bend it using the vine. Right, I bent it down by hand about uh, three quarters of the way and then used a 
2x4 and a hammer to uh, get the sharper right angle uh, at the last like quarter of the bend. Then for the second bend, I pinch the metal between two 2x4s two in the vise and bend it over to 90 degrees. This one's next. Okay, so here's our stand. Uh, to get this bend past the 90 degrees, simply set it down on the table and then just bend it by hand. Um, now, it fits up real nice to the bottom of the cabinet. And I've already drilled holes here for the quarter inch bolts to connect it to the cabinet. I'm not going to weld this because it's inside and very difficult to reach with a welder. Uh, then I, I'm thinking about making a faceplate so that it looks like a solid block of metal. Here is the metal cabinet sitting up on its stand. Even without the bolts, it's pretty solid. Now to make this facing piece for the base, I've cut out a piece of masonite exactly the right shape, but uh, a little bit inside of the right size to compensate for the width of the uh, nozzle of the plasma cutter. Now that facing piece for the base has been tack welded in place so that it actually looks like one big block of metal and then it will be bolted up against the bottom of the cabinet and serve to keep it upright and square. Here you can see the inside of the base and how it is bolted with quarter inch bolts to the curved bottom of the cabinet and now holds the cabinet very securely upright. Now the final step for the day is an eighth inch thick aluminum chassis and as you can see I have two rails in here for it to slide in on. Then there will be rails on top to hold it down so that it can't lift up. Now for the upper rails to guide the chassis sheet that slides in and out. Uh, before C-clamping them to the sides of the cabinet, I use some thin cardstock to shim a little clearance so that they will not hinder the uh, passage of the chassis sheet. Then, uh, then after welding the upper channels in place, pull out the paper shims and the chassis slides in and out very smoothly. Now making the back door is probably one of the trickiest parts because you have to make a form for the plasma cutter that is precisely shaped but three sixteenths of an inch smaller than the piece you actually want. And that will make up for the difference between where the hole is in the nozzle and the edge of the nozzle is. Okay, once you have done that then we're going to clamp this down on our sheet of 16 gauge uh, cold roll steel and cut out our back door. And then, as if by magic, we have a perfect fitting rear door for our cabinet. Uh, next step will be to put in the little L brackets that will hold the cabinet and also allow us to put some screws through here to hold it in place. The three brackets are made uh, to hold the back door and I welded a nut onto each so that uh, a screw can pass through the back door and into the nut to hold it on securely. Here are the three brackets in place and we simply drop the back door in and then put in machine screws in the three positions and we'll screw into the nuts that are connected to the brackets. And here is the rear of the cabinet with the back door secured in place. Now it's time to cut a hole in the back door uh, for a vent. We're going to use a piece of the same material we used on top. Uh, these are the centers for a one inch hole that will be cut in each of these four positions to give a rounded corner for the cutout, make it look a little nicer. All right, the one inch holes have been drilled in all four corners to give the radius uh, corners to the opening. Now it's time to cut along these lines with the saber saw. Now that a nice smooth rectangular hole has been cut in the back door, it's time to weld in the same uh, type of perforated metal that was used on the top vent. 
All right, the screen is now welded into the back door. Flip it over. You see how nice it looks. Drop it into the back of the cabinet. Put in the three screws and it's ready to go. And now for a very challenging addition to the amplifier is going to be a really fancy volume control knob on the right side. It's not finished. This is just the kind of the uh, the basic form right here. And it's going to be connected over here uh, to a needle that will show the position of the volume control knob. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but uh, we saw that Bell Labs uh, amplifier on eBay. I posted pictures of it on my Facebook page that was over-engineered like this with a knob and an indicator needle. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to need to machine two pulleys, one on the inside underneath the metal here on uh, this shaft and one over here on this shaft so that they, when they're connected with a belt, will move in unison. Now to machine the pulleys, I first need to get a one and a half inch diameter piece of aluminum rod uh, so that it will fit into the lathe. Step one in making the pulleys will be to drill a perfectly centered quarter inch hole down the center of the rod. Then we install a facing bit in our tool holder, lock it in, and then we're going to make this face up perpendicular uh, to the side and smooth. Then we install a separating blade or cutter into our tool holder, slide it down, lock it in, and then we're going to advance it down about a quarter inch or maybe five sixteenths and that will cut off, just like a slice of bologna, we're going to cut off the right hand side here and that will be our first pulley. We're not going to cut all the way through though, we're going to cut uh, for a ways and then cut the inlet that holds the belt in the center here of the pulley edge. Here you can see that cut off way removing our first pulley from the rod. Then we'll use this pointed cutter to go in and put about a 60 degree angle on the inside edges of the uh, pulley sides and then excavate a nice square floor. Then the final step is to use that cutoff blade to go in and separate the pulley from the uh, rest of the aluminum rod. And now that the separating blade has done its work, we have a nice aluminum pulley, just the right size and width for our belt. The next step is to drill and thread a hole uh, from the perimeter in here to the center and uh, then tap it uh, for a set screw to hold this uh, pulley tightly on the shaft. First I drill the hole uh, slightly smaller than the tap and then I tap the pulley uh, that passage all the way through uh, so my set screw now it can be threaded in and tightened down to hold the pulley snug against that shaft from the needle. Then using an Allen wrench we'll tighten that set screw down to where it's just about ready to have contact with that needle shaft. There's the needle uh, and shaft with the pulley securely attached to it. Then one final touch that really makes a difference when you have metal to metal contact and that is don't have metal to metal contact. Put a thick layer of felt on the back of the knob and of the pulley so that when they press up tight against the metal be dead quiet and just smooth as glass. Okay, here's an inside view of the two pulleys. Now, I, I just have a couple of rubber bands here just to kind of verify clearance and all. I'm going to end up using a really nice neoprene belt, but the rubber bands work pretty well. As you see when I turn the knob over here on the left, the needle shaft rotates in perfect unison, and 
both sides of the belt clear this potentiometer. And then from the front view, and again don't be worried, this is not the final knob, um, watch the needle move in perfect unison with the volume control. And of course there will be some nice looking uh, backing here for this gauge. The next engineering challenge was to make that big knob on the front communicate with the volume control pot on the chassis. So the way I decided to do it is to cut a screwdriver like tip into the rod from the front knob and then a deep slot in the uh, pot shaft. Then I cut and machined a short piece of pipe it will fit over uh, the shaft from the knob and this is going to connect the two very much like a, a distributor and oil pump connect in a Chevrolet engine. Without the little piece of pipe it's possible that the two shafts could uh, come disconnected but with the pipe it will hold the two shafts together end to end and maintain their uh, positive connection. Now when the chassis with the volume control pot is slid into place the two shafts will connect and now the knob has complete and uh, precise control over the volume control pot. Also this pulley then will communicate with the needle indicator. Now it's time to attach a vertical wall about two inches wide to the rear of the chassis so that the AC receptacle, fuse holder, and on-off toggle switch can be accessed through a hole in the back door. Here's the rear panel uh, for the chassis. Uh, rounded the corners um, and bent it, drilled it, and now it's time to drill matching holes in the uh, chassis plate so that it can be attached. Now that the rear panel is attached to the chassis, it's time to cut out a corresponding hole in the back door so that when the back door is in place, we'll be able to access the fuse holder on-off toggle switch and have a place for the uh, power cord to enter. Here's the rear control panel in place. These are just temporary screws. I'm going to use the tapered head ones for a flush uh, surface here on the chassis. We have the 4 ohm output, 8 ohm output, power toggle, a fuse holder, and a nicely grommeted power cord which coils up and stashes quite neatly uh, in the base. Uh, since I left the rear panel off and now we just roll it up, tuck it in there, and we can tote to our heart's content. Uh, speaking of grommets, there'll be no reason to moan and groan about a missing grommet or two on this chassis because look at this great selection that I got at Harbor Freight. Next we'll have to cut a hole in the back door so that all the jacks and controls uh, are easily accessible with the back door in place. Here is the back door with the hole cut to permit access to the uh, jacks and controls with the back door in place. Um, also, I will be putting felt between uh, the uh, control panel and the rear of the door to prevent any, any sort of rattles or buzz. Now step 9456, we uh, position the rubber feet on the base and mark for the holes to be drilled for uh, I guess number 10 screws to hold the feet in place. Here we have the rubber feet screwed in place. I flipped the cabinet over on a really flat surface to see if it wobbled at all. If it did I would shim uh, whatever foot was a little short but it all came out uh, nice and square. So this step is done. To make the rings that I use around the instruments and dials I start out with a piece of tempered uh, fiberboard uh, and then cut out a hole the size of the inside diameter of the ring and then because I don't have a hole cutter the size of the outside I'm going to use the bandsaw to cut this out and smooth it. Then we're going to use the sanding table to apply a curvature. Here's the ring with the proper size uh, inside and outside and now it's time to apply a curvature to this 
edge right here. I don't have any router bits that are this small, so I'm going to have to do it by hand on the sanding table. I've rough cut that curvature. Uh, now it's time to finish it uh, by hand with sandpaper. Here's the finished ring. Now it's time to apply uh, several coats of silver paint and clear lacquer and build up a finish on it so that it looks more like cast aluminum than uh, fiberboard. Well, we're pretty well done with the initial construction of the steampunk amp. Let's take a look at the face. You can see here the uh, little gear escutcheons for the uh, high and low uh, gain inputs. I just set these dial indicators down. There's one here with the pot in it to give you an idea how they're going to look. You can see uh, this is the big fancy volume knob and that it does control the volume gauge very well. I've also made uh, these bezels for the pilot light openings and around both the gauge and the knob. Now with it standing up you see that coarse grill on top and the aluminum handle here with the uh, holes uh, bored in it, the recessed head screws, and the copper handle. Inside you can see there's just a simple neoprene belt to connect the two pulleys. The amp chassis slides in and out smoothly. It has the rear control panel attached and it's ready to be machined for the transformers, tube sockets, and other components. All it's lacking now is the installation of the back door and the amp will be physically complete. And here is the rear view with the back door in place. Now bear in mind there's a whole bunch of detail and finishing work to be done here as well as the construction of the amplifier and those uh, real special animated pilot lights uh, which you will see in the part two video. So be patient and stay tuned. You all seem to enjoy the drone footage that I've been adding onto my AMP videos and I thought you might get a kick out of a uh, brief snippet of my maiden voyage with this drone. Now this one's completely different from the one you've seen. The one that I've been using uh, is a commercially available one, fairly expensive, with very sophisticated stability programming uh, and such. Now this one is a hot rod drone, if you will. Very powerful motors, uh, not a whole lot of stability. Uh, it's a real handful to fly. Okay, it's extremely fast. Uh, it handles, uh, it responds immediately and uh, like hot rods it's rather unpredictable so I warn you this maiden voyage is one that you will not soon forget there'll be no music I just want you to hear the sound of the propellers uh, it's got a gimbal mounted camera here that uh, will remain somewhat stable throughout the flight and um, global positioning uh, really nice little LED light for use at night okay but I, uh, like I said, this thing's a hot rod and it's going to behave like it. I also warn you that about two-thirds of the way through there is for some reason a total loss of power and you're going to go into an inverted deadfall of probably 50 to 100 feet. So tighten your seat belts because here we go.